Right. Uh, very good morning uh, and uh, good evening wherever that you are. Uh, greetings um, to all of you. Uh, now that um, Ajana Soko is in the room here with us, let us all put our palms uh, in Anjali and um, pay respects to Tanajan by uh, offering three bows. First bow, please. Second bow. And third bow. It's wonderful to have you here on the Good Friday, uh, Tanajan. Hope Good that you feel well. <laughs> right, so uh, Tanajan, um, the floor is now open to you um, to lead us in uh, a short meditation, and then we'll request for a Dharma talk, and you could uh, follow on with a Dharma reflections. Okay. So just to let you know, because this is a morning time here in the UK before the meal. So we have about an hour, 15, an hour and a half together. So we're going to start just with sitting quietly together just for a few moments. Remember these... Uh, periods that we call formal meditation. Nothing very formal about it. It's really about relaxing. Just noticing the body and the mind. Noticing the silence around us. And in terms of consciousness, conscious experience, just notice that what arises in consciousness is this experience of the body, what it feels like sitting here. And the experience of the mind, the mood in the mind, Emotions, if there are any noticeable emotions. Noticing the arising and passing of memories and thoughts. And what we call meditation, what we call practice, is really just coming back to here and now. Noticing what here and now is like. How the body feels. Comfortable or not quite comfortable. At ease or not. Some areas are relaxed, some areas are maybe a bit tight or sore. So we're just opening up to the present moment. bringing to it the willingness to know it for what it is. It's like Long Paul is always telling us, it's like this. In order to be able to recognize that it is like this, we need to be interested and curious to look, what is it like? What does the body feel like? Sitting, breathing in, Breathing out. And the mind is like this on Friday, end of the week.
mid-morning here in England, afternoon in Singapore, whatever time it is, just notice right now it's like this. And we might like it or not like it, the way it is, the way this body feels, the way this mind is. That's also part of the way it is. Likes and dislikes are like this. So we learn to just remind ourselves to just relax with the way it is. Breathing in, breathing out. Gently staying with the sensations of the breathing here and now in a relaxed way. And just watch the body, notice how it feels. Watch the mind, notice how it feels. And from this position of just being present and recognizing how things are here and now, whatever arises that ceases, we allow things to arise and to cease. Notice in this process of just watching from this position of presence here and now, being with the body and mind, how allowing what arises to just follow its course and cease. 
even if we get carried away with a memory, with a thought, with a feeling, just coming back to the body, coming back to the breath and allowing things to cease. There's a sense of settling, a sense of relaxation, of ease. Coming back to this sense of knowing, whether it's called consciousness or awareness, sati, sati sampajanya, all these different terms pointing to this ability to just be present and know the body is like this, the mind is like this, experience is like this. And all these things arise and cease, like the breath, breathing in, breathing out, they come and go. And the sense of knowing is relaxing because we don't need to create it. It's always here and now. Bosomedo likes to sometimes say, it's the only thing that's real. And because it is here and now, always available, we can come back to it and relax.
in the course of this process of coming back to the knowing and relaxing into it, the knowing is the point. That's what's important. So we can guide ourselves towards the relaxing into it, but also notice how relaxing is very pleasant. And then sometimes we have a tendency to just slide into the relaxing part and forget about the knowing. So if that happens, not notice that. In a way, we're enjoying and starting to indulge in a pleasant feeling. So rather than indulge in it, notice it and come back to the knowing. Because that is what helps us stay with this presence where wisdom arises, where wisdom informs us reveals the nature of sankaras that arrive and cease. And that side of practice that helps us stay vigilant, even when things do become calm and peaceful and quiet, that which prevents us from sliding into indulging these feelings of relaxation and peace is Dhamma Vichaya, this investigating, being present, watching, witnessing here and now as feelings in the body arise and cease, moods and thoughts and memories come and go. And that wakeful watchfulness the investigative aspect of it is that which appreciates this arising and ceasing is impermanence the unsatisfactoriness no matter what we try to hold on to can't satisfy temporarily maybe and even then And it's this Dhamma this wakefulness, that allows us to recognize none of this is self.
So with this noticing, breathing in and out, experiencing the body and the mind as they are. Most of you with your eyes closed, now you can open your eyes. Consciousness is still here. The body is like this. Eyes closed and eyes open. The sense of presence is really something that we practice like this in what we call formal meditation. But it's very good to learning to recognize this sense of presence. And then when we open our eyes, maybe change postures, not to just throw it out the window until the next sitting, but sort of notice the sense of awareness of presence, it's still there. Not to forget it, because that's, if we stay with that, then that's our refuge. And then practice really becomes something we can do in any posture at any time of the day. And these periods of sitting become oftentimes periods where the body is more peaceful. We go to a quiet place to do it, so it's a more peaceful, more pleasant, quieter experience, and the mind can experience quieter states. And then the cultivation of this, staying with this presence is something we can carry through the various activities of the day. So I did not bring a little bell to signify the end of our sitting, but this is it. Brahma, Jaloka, Vibhati, Sahandhati. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Bhutan tamman sankhan namatsan So the request was that uh, today the topic would be the 32 parts. It's, uh, it's not very common to, outside of monastic circles, to be addressing the 32 parts, because this is a topic that has a bit of an unsavory reputation. In Pali, it's often referred to as asuba, which is a term that basically means unbeautiful. Suba in Pali means beautiful. And with the A in front is kind of the opposite, what is not beautiful. And it's very interesting to notice the um, unattractiveness of the topic makes the a relationship to it, to, very often determines the relationship to it. So I like to think of the 32 parts as that rather than uh, mm -hmm. anything disgusting or repulsive. Because if we try to talk about something like that, people usually would rather hear about something inspiring. Talking about the repulsiveness of the body is not attractive. It's not very good marketing. And uh, sometimes people are not quite, not very keen to hear about that. They'd rather hear about some more inspiring things. 
So that attitude in itself reveals what this is all about. It reveals this tendency we have to be attracted to what's beautiful and positive and be repelled by what is unbeautiful, boring, ugly. So the Buddha uh, uses this as a tool to learn to look at this body. So as his whole teaching is about recognizing Dhamma, we need to recognize what it is that we're holding on to that prevents us from seeing the Dhamma. And the whole aspect of non-self, anatta, which is really a very specifically Buddhist teaching, is something that we learn we need to learn to investigate. So in the same way the Buddha teaches the Four Noble Truths, Four Noble Truths, he starts with pointing out suffering as it's a reality that we all experience, but we naturally tend to turn away from. Either we don't recognize it or we don't really want to recognize it. Same with the body, there are aspects of the body that are real, but we're not interested in. They're not things that we are inclined to turn our attention to. And because of that, because we're not willing to look at the body in certain ways, it conditions how we relate to the body. So the basic premise is that this body is desirable and it's mine. We identify with it, meaning we give it a name and we relate to it in ways that are in which we get very involved with it. Anything that happens to it gives rise to a lot of emotions, whether they're positive or negative. And so what the Buddha's pointing out is, like in the Four Noble Truths before saying, there's the path or there's the end. There's this liberation, which is fantastic and wonderful. He points out to what the issue is that we can immediately work with. So with the body, that's what he's doing as well. In the four foundations of mindfulness, in that teaching, the first foundation is the body. And he elaborates on six different ways of relating to the body. They're all about learning to look at the body as being a body. And they're not things that we usually do. So when we follow his recommendation and start looking at the body as something that breathes, as something that goes through four postures day in and day out, as something that moves about, the arms bend and extend, the legs as well, we turn forward, backwards, chew and swallow food, go to the bathroom. It's made of four elements. It's made of these 32 parts. And when it dies, it just rots away to dust. All these aspects of the body that he's pointing to are things that we don't usually look at. When we do take on, like just take on, taking on any of these six ways of looking at the body as we take it on as an exercise, just for the sake of trying out something Buddha recommended, it will start revealing the attitude that we do have towards the body. Just a second. Um, and it reveals that the way we do usually relate to the body is really just seeing this, what we see on the screen. We see skin, hair, teeth, nails. We see the wrapping of the body. And even then we don't see most of it because we wear clothing, we cover it up. So we learn to recognize what this body is in reality compared to what we usually, out of habit of our ignorance, are willing to recognize as being the body. So these 32 parts, they're an extremely useful way of learning to look at the body in a different very different from a different perspective.
what it reveals is that our usual way of looking at the body is that it's me. We want it to be in good health. We want it to last forever. We want it to be beautiful. And it is above and before anything else. It's something we identify with that defines us, our sense of self, our personality. So the Buddha is kind of uses a metaphor. He says, if you have a butcher and his apprentice who are getting ready to slaughter a cow and prepare all the parts for sale, he points out to the perception that we have before they do anything. When we see a cow, we identify it as a cow and we call it a cow. <clears throat> and then when the butcher slaughters the cow and cuts it up, and prepares it for sale, separating all the different parts of the cow, puts it out on a trestle table or on the butcher's shop or wherever they sell that. When we look at that, we don't call all those different parts a cow. We call those different parts by their name, the hide or the skin in our case, all the different organs, the bones, tendons, so it's, very, it's a very good and a very interesting metaphor because it really points to how differently we relate to the same group of things. All those organs were wrapped up in skin, we call it one thing, when they're all displayed separately, we don't perceive it the same way. So how we look at things very much informs perception, conditions perception. So if we want to try to understand what the Buddha is talking about when he says this body is not self, then we want to not just understand it intellectually, which is easy enough to do. We want to bring that intellectual understanding down into the heart and really kind of relate to this body as something that isn't self. We have to learn to let go of this conditioning, which the way of looking at it that does lead to perceiving it as self. And the best way to do that is to change points of view. So we have to cultivate that. And so this is what these six ways of relating to the body are from the four foundations of mindfulness, but specifically the 32 parts really help us learn to recognize this body has been made of many different parts. And as we do that, we realize a lot of them are actually not beautiful. So look at in society, you open any magazine, you travel in the subway by car, you look at TV. Any way you turn, you can see that the, a lot of our conditioning in life, a lot of the things that are marketed are all presented from this perspective of and presenting beauty and enhancing beauty, presenting health and enhancing health. So really making this body beautiful and something desirable. So that's our conditioning. The Buddha is giving us a tool to learn to recognize that conditioning, to learn to let go of it. And the 32 parts are a way to do that. And at the same time, we need to see what this body is made of. So we have this traditional list of parts. It always starts by the superficial parts, which are hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. And that is what is immediately visible. And then when the Buddha goes through the list, he goes then inside to the organs, to the what the meat, the flesh and bones and the organs. So all different muscles are either flesh or muscles, and then separates a category for tendons and sinews, ligaments, and then we have the bones and the bone marrow. And then he goes through a series of organs like kidneys and heart and spleen and liver and intestines and even the contents of the intestines, whether we've just eaten food and it's kind of undigested or whether it's gone sufficiently far down the digestive tract to be start to be identified as excrement. 
And then he's also talking about a lot of the fluids that are in the body, whether it's tears or snot or mucus, saliva, the oil of the joints, the sweat. So altogether we have these 32 parts. And it's sometimes difficult to find a way of using this long list of things in a way that's really meaningful and practical. So Ajahn Chah, he had a very, a very engaging way of using this. He would recommend to use the periods of walking meditation to bring the images of all these different parts, bring, all, bring them up in the mind and walk back and forth on the, on the way of walking meditation path. And as we walk up and down the meditation path, we put down one part and then the next, and then the following one, and do so until we've put all 32 parts down. And we've got basically this body, which is here at the beginning of the process. It's all of, all of a sudden it's spread out all over the floor. So I had quite a bit of fun. I still have quite a bit of fun doing this. And you can do it sitting down and just putting it all out on the floor in front of you if you like to, if it works for you. I enjoy doing it walking better, but uh, it's up to the individual. But it's, it's a very, very interesting exercise to undertake because certain aspects, as we do this, certain aspects are going to be off-putting or outright repulsive. And sometimes when, you, when we do that and we really have some good images in mind of certain parts of the body and we put that down in front of us, it's completely yucky, it's disgusting. And we can actually even feel such lightly nauseated by the perception of some of the organs. So when, when, this, <clears throat> when this is called asuba, it's not a misnomer, it's called that for a very good reason, because it's not beautiful. But it's important not to forget that on the scale from beautiful to disgusting, what we call asuba, meaning not beautiful, it includes all the neutral in between. So I don't, many of you might be vegetarian, but whether you are or not, we've all seen meat at the butchers in the supermarket. We know what that looks like livers and T-bone steaks. We know what bone and marrow looks like. So we all have these images in the mind and we relate to them differently according to context. So when we go to the butchers and there's a piece of steak, a piece of meat, we might find it very beautiful and look forward to cooking it and having it with a mushroom sauce and share it with guests in the evening with a cup or a glass of red wine. And yet the same meat, when it comes from our bodies, we don't perceive it with the same sense of relish and anticipation. And when we look at the news or newspapers and magazines, which talk about wars and car accidents and all kinds of situation life, which kind of sometimes reveals bodies that are exploded and cut open and wounded and whatnot, then the reaction is shocking. And we're in each case looking at the same thing. It's not different. So the point of view really matters a lot in conditioning the perception. So when we engage in this exercise of trying to change this way of looking at the body, instead of just seeing what we see on the screen right now, we see a body, we see the skin, not much hair on the head of this one, but all of you seem to have more hair than I do. But this is what we're seeing. We're just seeing these first five parts. I mean, even here, there's, there are nails on the hands and even just those five parts. Notice how different it is when we're looking each, at each other just without trying to incline towards Dhamma at all. And just allowing whatever conditioning is present to do what it does. Then if I had hit one of my fingers with a hammer and it had a black nail, we'd say, oh, that's not a very beautiful nail. It must have hurt, but it's, 
we look forward to it healing and not being ugly anymore with the black and blue coloration under the nail. So that's our usual way of relating to the body is in terms of beauty. And then when all of a sudden we look at that and we look in terms of say simply nails, we all need to cut our nails, they grow. If we don't cut them, it kind of makes tends to make life difficult. So when you are relating to your nails on a daily basis, we go, well, these are my nails. 10 fingernails, 10 toenails. And this is, notice how we relate to these things as, well, yeah, this is me, this is my body, my nails. But then when we cut the nails, <clears throat> stop for a second before chucking them, whatever you do with them into the bin or out the window into the garden, down the, flush them down the toilet or the shower or whatever it is you do with your nail clippings. Before you let them go, look at them and ask yourself, those nail clippings, is that still me? Do you relate to those the same way you relate to the, the ones that are still on the fingers? And you'll notice that you don't. This is something to look after. That is something to get rid of. That's rubbish, garbage. It's dirty. You all go to the hairdresser. And you go to the hairdresser not just out of convenience, because when they grow long, they're difficult to deal with, but you want a nice haircut. And if your head or hair are dry and splitting or floppy, you want to look good. So there's an investment in how the hair look. We care. We want it to look a certain way and not another way. So there's, a, there's all this emotional involvement in it. We go to the hairdresser, the hair gets cut, drops to the floor. You pay the bill and you walk out. You're not interested in what's on the floor anymore. And if the hair that just came off your head falls on the floor and gets mixed up with the hair that's being cut off the neighbor's head, we don't make a fuss about it. And we don't relate to that hair as something that needs to be made beautiful so that it's presentable and looks good. If we step in as the first customer to the hairdressers and the floor is covered in hair, we say it's dirty. That's how we relate to hair. And so noticing that difference between self and not self. When we, really, when we relate to this body as self, we care, we worry, we want, we don't want, we like, we dislike. We want it to stay the way it is and not change, or we want it to be otherwise because we don't like it the way it is. A lot of an emotional involvement arises from a relationship to the body that is based on this identification with it. When you go to the supermarket and you walk past the fridge with all the meat in it, we don't relate to that and being anybody's. We all assume it's pork and beef and lamb and whatever it is they sell there. I wouldn't have a clue if there was human meat in the fridge if I walked past it. I wouldn't recognize it and I don't identify and relate to it as being anybody. Heidi the cow and Jackie the chicken. We don't relate to it. We don't identify with it. And so where con contemplation of these 32 parts really, really bears fruit in terms, in terms of re revealing this sense of self and non-self, and then the involved the emotional involvement that comes with self, and the sense of freedom that comes from the perception of not self is working on this one, on this body. So next time you go to the hairdresser, before you step in, just notice my hair. Before I shave, I kind of look in the mirror and I look at all this little fuzz here. And intellectually, I know it's not self. 
but just watching at the usual conditioned way of relating to it, this is still me. I have a, I have fuzz on my head. I have hair on my head. And then you go and cut it, shave it, whatever you do. Before you discard it, watch it. And one, ask yourself, is this still me? And there's no way it is. We don't keep the hair we cut. We don't keep the nails we clip. We don't keep the skin that flakes off us. So there's a lot of, there are a lot, many ways that we can kind of look. And this is just talking about the, the first five parts. Teeth as well. Two days ago, I accompanied Lumpur Sumero to a visit to the dentist. Since we came back from the travels, he'd been mentioning that he had a slight ache on a tooth, nothing very serious, just an ache that came and went. So we went to see the dentist who examined it and said the pulp in the canals of the molar was dead. And there was a very slight infection under the tooth and inflammation. So he had a choice between doing root canal treatment or just pulling the tooth. And so we went back a second time, it was two days ago, and he decided to just have the tooth pulled because it's a much easier procedure and uh, doesn't involve such long hour, an hour and a half sitting there with your mouth open. And it turned out he wasn't using it for chewing very much. So the teeth, tooth got pulled. And it's very interesting to watch the tooth in the same way we notch, watch nail clippings. We, want, we notice the hair being cut. So I'm sure that he doesn't relate to his body as self on an emotional level anymore. But that's the exercise that we can, an exercise we can use to kind of notice what does it feel like when it's here, this sense of self. And then when we're separated from it, Noticing what that's like. So coming back to this exercise of walking up and down the corridor, meditation path in the forest, in the monastery, wherever you want to try that out. Try that. Just what I recommend is a stopping at the beginning of your little walking meditation section. Have the list in your hand. If you've memorized it, memorize the 32 parts. Just start with the first one. You go hair of the head. And then walk down your meditation path, your one length of the Jongrom path. And just walk casually and just notice what it is like. This is my hair. Then you reach the end of the path, turn around and just imagine cutting it, shaving it, whatever, and then put it down on the floor, just on one little spot, a nice little pile of hair. And then notice that. And notice how different it is now from when it was here. Now it's just hair. What would we what would we do with it? What would we do with it now? Well, if it was inside indoors, we'd sweep it and discard it as rubbish, vacuum cleaning it up. It's basically we're related to it as something dirty that needs to be removed. And then on walking back to the beginning of the meditation path, just keep that in mind and let the mind play with it. Notice and then notice the difference when you walk to the end. Notice what it is like when it is on you, part of this, my body. And then walking back, notice you've put it down. What is it like now? And when we're walking outside, if the wind blows it away, we don't really care. So noticing that difference between when it's me and when it's not me, when it's self and when it's not self how much we care, and then how, how indifferent we are to it. And then before starting again, you turn around, you take the next part of the body, hair of the, hair of the body, in the armpits, wherever the little fuzz, very light fuzz that grows almost all over the body, wherever that is. And again, walking one to the end of the path. When it's on me, it feels like this. And then you just make a little pile of all the body hair next to the hair of the head, a new little pile, hair of the body. And just sort of bring it up as an image in the mind and then walk back to the beginning of the 
John Brown path. Notice the difference. Nails, you can appreciate what the nails are like walking down the path and then you stop, turn around, put all the nails down, all 20 of them. 10 hand nails, 10 toenails. Nice little pile right there next to the other two piles. And just bring it to mind as an image. Now that it's there, it's not mine anymore. I can let it go. It's whatever happens to it doesn't really affect me or matter. And little by little, as you walk back and forth and put down one body part after the other, allow the mind to kind of play with the images and it's a way of nourishing an interest in the process. And just notice how things get lighter and lighter as all the time you put this down, even though it's an exercise of the imagination and you're not actually cutting up your body and spreading it on the floor, it'd be impossible to do. But as we let go of things, every time we let go of things and there's a sense of, I put that down and I don't care about that anymore. In the heart and the mind, one feels lighter and lighter until we have put down all 32 parts. And then the, the, the more uh, solid parts that you can put down as lumps, a liver here, a kidney there, a lung here, a pile of bones, the skin we can just drop as a sack on the floor or we can hang it from a peg in the house or from a branch, flop it over a branch of a tree and just leave the body parts all over the place. And you notice that you kind of, you don't really care. It looks dirty. Maybe someone needs to come and clean it up afterwards, but I appreciate that difference in perception between here where we care for it and there we don't. So this is a way of cultivating this sense of it's not self when it's down on the floor. And then Ajahn Chah suggested putting it back together again. And that is a very interesting exercise because when you've put it all down and you don't care about it anymore, it might not strike you as being particularly disgusting. It's just undesirable. Let it go. But when you start putting it back together again, so what I do is I start with a skeleton because I've got a bit of a mechanistic uh, bend to my mind. So I put the skeleton then, and then I can put everything back onto the skeleton. So it kind of works for me, but whatever works for you. But notice how when you start picking things up and putting them back here, there's a sense of, ah, oh, yuck, that arises. When I put down an organ that I can find at the butchers, meaning it doesn't have, to, it's not particularly human, but a lot of animals have livers, kidneys, muscles, bone with bone marrow. I mean, Italian restaurants sell osobuco. It's something very appreciated by some people. Fine culinary item. So basically it's bone with bone marrow and meat. And these things are food for half of nature. I very often sort of started being amused during my exercises doing this where I put down say my liver and in Thailand where I spent many years, a lot of dogs that come wandering into the monastery sniffing around, chasing each other and then leaving. If they come across a liver in the forest there's no doubt what they'll do with that and just snatch it, go and try and hide and see if they can eat it all by themselves before another dog comes to challenge their lunch. That's the nature of a liver. Many things happen to a liver. So when a liver is in here, it functions a certain way, but sometimes it dysfunctions, it gets sick. Problems arise. That's all what happens to a liver when it's in the body, when you put it outside and even on the floor, then other things happen. It might just shrivel up and dry if the weather is sunny and dry. It may get moldy and rot away if the weather is very damp. 
If animals are around, very likely dogs and birds and all kinds of creatures will come and fight over it and eat it. That's also the nature of the liver. So when you walk up and down a meditation path or you're just here in the sitting meditation and putting it all out in front of you, whatever perceptions arise when it's out there, it's not self, it's not desirable, it's not beautiful, it's just... It's just a liver, it's just a kidney. Sometimes it's actually it can appear disgusting, yucky, gooey, sticky. So when you have put everything down and then you start putting everything back together again, we don't want to be associated with all this kind of stuff. If you have the courage to ask your hairdresser to collect the hair, to put it in a bag for you so you can take it back home and not feel like you're gonna seem a bit like a bit of a nutcase if you ask that, try it and see what the reaction is when you're carrying your bag of hair, cut hair around. Notice what that feels like. And so when we're doing this exercise just by imagination, sort of putting all the body parts all over the place and then putting them back together, the reaction is like, no, thank you, I don't want that. But gently, kind of just noticing it and doing it gently without, have you noticed that when you do that, there's a strong reaction, so a really averse reaction, just stop and wait for a bit and just sort of gently bring it back together because basically we're still using this body, it's not yet dead. And when you succeed to bring it all back together and then in the end, just put the skin back to cover it all, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails back, teeth back, and now it's functioning and useful again. The perception you have of the body is a very different one from the one you started off with before the exercise. All of a sudden, it, kind of, it, it literally brings home the reality of how this body and its 32 parts are not self. So we started off with this being me and mine, and then we spread it out all over the place. And, and this perception becomes very obvious. This is a bunch of body parts, not me, not mine. So now we have this perception of not me, not mine. And we put all of that back together. And that's when we can start developing this perception that even here, it's not me, not mine. It's still hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin, flesh, sinews and ligaments, and bones and bone marrow, and kidneys and heart and liver, and so on. So this exercise is really an incredibly powerful exercise in terms of learning to develop an alternative perception of the body that does not give rise to a sense of self but really kind of reveals the body for what it is, reveals it as being, like the Buddha said, he compared it to a bag of grain. If someone brings us a bag of grain with all kinds of mixed grains in there, we kind of open the bag up and start taking them out and say, oh, this is rice, this is uh, barley, this is corn. With interest, studying to see what this bag of rice is made of. Then, then we start relating to that body this body here as 32 parts that have their own nature. Their job is to be healthy, but their job is also to get sick. That's part of their nature. They function as long as they can, and then they start dysfunctioning. And when the dysfunction is important enough, then this body can't function anymore as a healthy body, as a living body, and it ceases functioning. We call that death. So cultivating this perception of the body is a very, very powerful tool. It's actually simple, and it's extremely powerful how this exercise reveals and then cultivates this alternative perception of the body. And this perception of the body does not give rise to a sense of self. It's not 
mixed up with this delusion that it is mine. When things happen to it, we recognize like we're cutting up food and we cut through the skin. And instead of worrying about it, we can still look after it. We go, yeah, that's also the nature of the body is it gets cut, skin gets cut, blood flows. And as we clean it up, we notice that we clean it up because when the blood drips on the counter, on our clothing, we put it in the laundry, we clean the counter because we consider it dirty. And just noticing that difference again, when it's in the body, it tends to be seen one way. When we cut a finger and blood starts leaking, we consider it dirty, atsuba, not beautiful. We clean it and remove it. So cultivating this is a very, very powerful exercise that the Buddha encouraged, certainly monks and nuns, to uh, do regularly, but it is such a precious exercise that I'd recommend anybody who's willing and interested to, uh, to undertake. And then as you do that, again, we're coming back to the same thing we came back to in the meditation at the beginning. There is this body, it's like this, it feels like this, and this is its nature. And then there's the mind. And what it highlights, once we're not identifying with the body as self anymore, then we start noticing consciousness and awareness, the knowing that this body is impermanent, that this body is following its own nature, that it's not self. And finally, a last simile, very beautiful simile the Buddha used when he was teaching the monks one day. He was probably walking across the countryside from one place of practice to another. And he picks up a bunch of leaves from the forest floor and he asks the monks, how do you feel about these leaves? And the monks are like, yeah, it's indifferent, they're just leaves. And the Buddha asks them, if I were to burn them, they turn to ashes, how would you feel about that? Indifferent, it's just leaves. And they'll rot away or get burned anyway. And the Buddha said, well, in the same way, try to cultivate that feeling about the body, knowing its nature is impermanent and relinquishing attachments and emotions bound up with this body. So I'll stop here with this and we still have about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Tanajan. I'm quite sure many of us um, uh, have been quite attentive, quite grossed out, and that uh, you may have got some questions. Um, please um, click on the raise hand button or type a question. And um, yeah, offer some feedback to Tanajan about the teachings and how that can uh, help us uh, each progress further. Anyone with a question? I have a question, Hanajan. Yes. When we practice um, the 32 parts of the body, must we go according to the order of the external before we get into the internal, or do we just whatever that comes to mind? Whatever really comes to mind is fine. But I've always found that there's wisdom in the way the Buddha presents his teaching. There's a reason why the Four Noble Truths are in the order they are, and not the other way around. There's a reason the Four Foundations of Mindfulness are in that sequence. And so with the 32 parts, you can actually just go to any which part, but you'll probably find as you're uh, 
going through the list that because the first five parts are these external ones that are the most visible ones, the ones we already notice. Unless you're a doctor or a nurse or a health practitioner, you don't usually have much interest in what's inside of the skin bag. So it's easier to come and relate to that because we already, we already have a relationship to hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. We're attached to it, want it to be beautiful, want it to be a certain color, not too dark, not too light, not to this, not to that. The hair, we want it a certain way. We like it the way it is and don't want it to change. Whatever it is, we have already a relationship with these more visible parts of the body. So there is value in starting with that. And there's also value in learning, memorizing the 32 parts. And it's not very difficult to memorize and to just go online on the internet or open books to just have some visual representation of what these different parts are. So then when we engage in this exercise, we have actually visually we, an imagination, there's something there to use. But as we do this, then we find sometimes, and it can change, but we find sometimes that certain body parts talk to us in a way that others don't. Like bile, for example, might not be something that makes a very big, big impression on most people's mind. Whereas, other parts of the body may. If uh, a member of the family has lung cancer or has died, like in my family, there's a uh, lung lung uh, issues have arisen in the past couple of generations. And I smoked for ten years. My parents were smokers, so I grew up in a household with kind of passive smoking. So my lungs are a bit of a weak spot. So I'm more aware of lungs. Other people have digestive issues. So maybe considering organs related to the digestive tract speak to them more because it's, it's a more meaningful part of their experience. Some people have joint, chronic joint pain. So maybe bones and joints. So you find as you go through this list that some of them speak to you more than others. But it's... Uh, I would recommend going through the list just for the sake of kind of going over the whole set and then kind of every now and again, kind of letting the mind follow its inclination to be more interested in one. Or if you find that there's one that you really don't want to investigate, it's not just indifferent. It's like, I don't want to go there. Maybe that's worth investigating, just looking at. Thank you, Panajan. Anyone's got a question? Um, Cheryl's raised her hand. Cheryl? Hello. Uh, thank you, Viku, for the reflections. Um, as I was following your uh, instructions to kind of put all the body parts on the ground, um, and when I came to the skeleton, I, when I placed it on the ground, I realized that the fear suddenly arose because there was nothing else to, to hold on to. and, and I think the, the mind quickly went to grab back all the body parts. Um, any advice on, on this? Yeah, just notice that. So when, when we when we do this, it's, it will reveal the attachment. So when fear arises, it kind of it shows us, oh wow, I'm really holding on to this thing. I'm not willing to let it go. So just notice that, and then we can't just toss it all out in one, in all in one go. We need to learn to do it progressively according to the attachments that are revealed. And so what you could do is like, instead of just plunking the whole skeleton there in one go, just give it a small bone to begin with. Yes, yeah, something easy to let go of. Just one and then look at that. And then maybe you can add another one later. And you need this almost like we need to, we need to teach ourselves how to let go. So some things we can just drop without any problems and others, other ones we find more difficult to. Or sometimes we find it easy to just put it all out there on the floor, but then putting it back together, the mind comes up with a very strong resistance. And then some days it's like this, maybe you try tomorrow and tomorrow you have no problem dropping the skeleton, but you don't want to let go of your heart. 
So just no notice as, as, as you do that, what is happening, because what's happening on an emotional level, it will be revealing the attachments and the feelings that are bound up with this body. Or you could also just look at a skeleton. It doesn't have to be years. If you find it difficult to, to put down the skeleton from this body, look at the skeleton of another body where there isn't that sense of identification and attachment. And just notice well, the, skele the skeleton in the Buddha's body, well, this is a statue, but the Buddha who passed away 20, almost 26 centuries ago now, he also had a skeleton in his body. He let go of that. That skeleton, in, in terms of skeleton, it was a skeleton exactly the same way this is, body has a skeleton, or your body has a skeleton. And then you, you're, kind of, you're kind of slowly feeding to the mind, to the perception that skeleton is skeleton. And other people's skeletons are the same as ours. And the cow's skeleton is made of the same calcium and phosphate and all this stuff than human skeletons are made of, or chicken skeletons. And it's kind of learning ways of relating to it in terms of it's a natural thing. Skeleton belongs to nature. When babies are born, they have parts that are bone, but most of it is cartilage. And little by little, that cartilage, as it grows, develops into bone. And then we go through life. And then at some point, the bone starts getting weaker as we get older. Maybe there's osteoporosis. It starts leaking calcium. It breaks more easily. In Thailand, when we're in monasteries, we have people who are who die are brought in for cremations. And even the fire will burn up a skeleton. And if the fire is really strong enough and lasts long enough, there are no bones left, maybe it's just tiny little fragments of bones, but a fire can really burn up bone. And so when you start thinking about skeleton, what is it made of, what is it? How, who has skeletons, where are they? How many people have died? Since the earth exists, we probably cover the whole planet with skeletons. And this ways of looking at skeleton is just another thing. So you're, you're start starting to change the perception of what a skeleton is. And then when you come back to this skeleton, it's like, yeah, this skeleton is the same. And then little by little, that emotional attachment starts lessening and loosening. And then it loosens enough, you can drop the skeleton on the floor as well. Pick it up later when you need it again. But notice also as you as you put down parts of the body, how consciousness and awareness is still here. And that helps us realize we're not the body. I can put down the body and let go of it, and there's still awareness. And that's also, in, in a way, when we let go of the body, it can be scary because that's what we usually hold on to and identify with. Sometimes these days, Lumpo Sumedho, in his, some of his Dhamma talks, he says, if you want to identify with anything, identify with awareness, with consciousness, because that's what you really are. You can't really identify with it and make it me and mine, no more than we can make the air and the clouds and the wind self. But it shows you how we, can, how we create that kind of sense of self through thinking, through emotional attachment. So, so use... use Use this and then see what, watch what the reaction is. And then if the reaction is a bit too strong and you realize, oh, I can't do this, try something smaller, try something lighter, maybe remove it, look at other skeletons. But generally the idea is to kind of realize that this body really is just made of food and will go back to ashes and become food for the next plants, for the next creatures. And it's really all just a cycle. And then there's awareness. And the sense of self is something we create. Is that helpful? Tanajan, um, I am uh, conscious of time. Um, but um, there is a one question in relation to hair. And uh, I think you can answer this quite quickly. Um, and it's in two parts. How can one understand hair 
that is not mine when this is cut off, there is still DNA inside that hair. Okay. Um, how does how can we practice such that we are not attracted to the hair of others? Example, the female, the long female hair, Allah, uh, the, the, the smooth, the smooth as silk hair that belongs to another person. So I guess the first part is the part about the DNA. It's, we create that sense of identification, whether it's with hair or with DNA in the hair. It's a convention. So in terms of convention, we still call this body and all its 32 parts Sajana Soko and those heads, not the whole body, but heads that I see on the screen have names as well. So that's we use the convention of identification still for practical purposes for relating to each other and for functioning together. But we, we, we learn to recognize it's a convention. So even when we see through the identification with the body, we might still, if someone asks me, who are you? I mean, I can just go full dhamma on them and say, I am no one. But usually we say, oh, I'm Ajana Soko. Hi, I'm Robert, John, Denise, or whatever the names are that we give each other. So DNA is just another convention. In terms of attraction to hair, if we watch, if we really look at what the process is in the life of hair, how does it start? It's really looking at arising and ceasing. So before there is no hair, like some babies are born with very little hair on their head or just very little thin tufts of hair. So that's the beginning of hair. And then what happens to hair? At one point in the process of hair, it might be long and silky and beautiful and attractive. And we're not trying to deny that. But if that is the only aspect of hair that we recognize, then we get stuck on the relationship to hair as being long and silky and attractive. Whereas if we learn to open up and look at the whole process of hair, before it was long, it was short, it was less attractive. And then what happens if you don't wash hair when it doesn't stay shiny for very long? Wait long enough, you get dreadlocks. And if you take a dreadlock to a lab, and ask people to tell you what's in there, I am convinced that you will find it positively disgusting. That's also the nature of hair. So we wash hair all the time because otherwise it gets dirty and it's not silky and beautiful. So what you're doing is kind of challenging the, the solidity of this perception that hair is beautiful and therefore attractive. And you challenge it by looking at other aspects of hair. So if someone with very long, beautiful and silky hair appears attractive under one set of circumstances, I suggest maybe you go to the shower after they've used it and they've left and you clean the shower drain and see if you find that hair long and silky and attractive. So it's we need to be willing to kind of investigate and look at the whole picture in a way. So look, if, if we find ourselves stuck with something or stuck in a relationship to something because we find it attractive and desirable, then we need to learn to investigate and look at the wider picture and look at other aspects of this one element that in certain circumstances looks like this and therefore causes a sense of attraction. And when you look at the wider picture, you find that you lose taste for it, or maybe it's still attractive, but it doesn't have the same pull because you know that before and after it's unattractive. And so it's almost like educating the mind to the, the whole picture of reality rather than allowing ignorance to just settle with one aspect of something that conditions our reaction to be very narrow and we may get stuck with. So investigating, investigating the, the whole story very often 
reveals more aspects of hair or skin or whatever it is. And then the, the, that kind of passion in the heart that arises because we only see the attractive aspect of something, hair, that passion kind of isn't fed by the same conditions. The, 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 the picture gets wider and then that doesn't give rise to the same passionate reaction. So that's why the Buddha calls it this passion. Learning to recognize things the way they are in reality leads to this passion. And when we lose the passion for it, the natural thing is to let go, relinquishment. And that relinquishment leads to liberation. So I'd love to answer more questions, but unfortunately, I think I need to need to close this meeting and to take care of feeding this body. Let us all now pay respects to Tanajan uh, by offering uh, the three vows. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bhagawa Buddha Bhagawan Danga Viva Devi Swakado Bhagawa Dango Dangma Namasati Supadipano Bhagavato Sawato Sango Sangang Namani Thank you, Tanajan. Uh, there are still a lot of questions, but I will collate them and I'll send them to you at a suitable occasion um, that um, we can have you again, that you can answer them. Okay. Well, thank you for all of you for joining and for, uh, I just noticed now that there are 106 participants and I think that's actually not a bad show up for such a usually unsavory topic. So it was very nice to see that so many people are interested. There were 120, 14 got, 14 must have grossed out after the, 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 the teaching. <laughs> well, still, it's an impressive show up. <laughs> thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jen. Bye.